Welcome to episode two of the 2023 Overwatch League offseason news recap. A ton has been going on behind the scenes since the previous video, and it seems like a lot of teams could be considering starting over in general. There's so much to cover and so much to discuss with you guys, so let's dive right into it. And be sure to give this video a like and subscribe if you want to stay up to date with all things Overwatch League news related. The first order of business will be to take care of some things that are more hot off the press, so to speak. For starters, we have the Shanghai Dragons announcing that they will not be bringing back Lee Jae Gon. They went back and forth with him with some negotiations, but in the end, they both decided it would be in their best interest to move on. And this is massive, right? It seemed like there was a chance the Dragons would get him back in there, they'd have their solid main support that they've used the last few years, but no. This is where their journey ends. Their Dragons title window has ended, and Lee Jae Gon wants to weigh his options as a free agent now. And considering his level of talent, there's going to be loads of interest across the entire Overwatch League. In particular, I'm going to be looking at the San Francisco Shock. I know it seems like a long shot, but they could always move Violet back to the flex support role, have him and Finn kind of bounce back and forth with each other, and then have Lee Jae Gon, a true main support, at that role. If not, maybe he could go younger and join the Philly Fusion. My point is, there's going to be options for Lee Jae Gon. He's one of the best main support players in the entire world, so job security is not an issue whatsoever. What is a concern, though, is the Dragons. Lee Jae Gon is a generational player, and now it's basically just lip and if they decide to keep Izayaki or not. For all we know, negotiations with him also might not have gone well, and he could be joining Lee Jae Gon in free agency very, very soon. The more stuff the Dragons end up losing, the more likely it is we could just see a total rebuild, whether that be around Lip, or with a brand new team in general will be something that we have to determine. But right now, the Dragons are in a pretty rough spot, and I think we're all curious to see if they intend to retool or rebuild. It can go both ways, right? This free agency class is very, very loaded, so they can definitely make a new team, but will they be the same as that championship core? Building around Lip is definitely a viable option, but can you kind of get that same synergy in Magic? I'm not too sure. If not, you could always look to sell Lip. With him being one of the best players on the planet, your asking price can be very high, and a lot of teams will be willing to accept it. Lip truly is that good, so we could see a world where the Dragons do that and then make a good sum of money, you know? They could build a decent roster even without Lip, like they'll have plenty of room to sign a new solid team for this new chapter they're about to embark on. If I was a betting man, I'd say the Dragons fully intend to build around Lip since he is their centerpiece and their guy in everything they've had this last year or so, but you never really know. Looking into the San Francisco Shock, who also have some pretty recent news, they ended up parting ways with Kilo. While it initially seemed like he was going to stay on the roster, it would seem that after some further negotiations and talks that Kilo decided he would be better off looking for a new team. From a shock standpoint, I don't think it's the hugest issue in the world. I think that Kilo has a lot of potential and he maybe could have developed into a bit more of a solid, you know, superstar-like player with another year under this coaching system, but the fact still remains that he was inconsistent and not somebody who could be a full-time starter. It seemed like at every possible opportunity, the shock were looking to put him on the bench. Kilo had his moments, don't get me wrong, on the Ash, the Widowmaker, even the Sojourn, he did have moments where we saw absolute brilliance, but it seemed to come in burst, he was a bit hot and cold, and oftentimes the guy that people were pointing the finger at, so to speak, and it seemed like at every possible moment, the Shock were looking to replace him outside of those very specific double sniper compositions and those payload maps, especially in the last couple of months of the year. At first, they had Sam playing the Sojourn, and then eventually they even had Proper play the Sojourn over Kilo, and think about what happened after they picked up Striker. We saw less and less and less of Kilo as time went on, and while it's clear the Shock were maybe invested in giving him another go, clearly he wasn't that important to them if they didn't want to play him all that much, and he seems replaceable if he's just going to be a specialist. But on the other hand, if you're Kilo, you probably want to test your waters, you know? Why stay on a team that you're only going to play like one third of the time on? With the flashes he's shown the last couple of years, maybe he thinks he could go to a team where he gets a lot more starting time, and I can't blame the guy if that's his mindset. In all likelihood, he could maybe go to one of those lower end teams, such as the Boston Uprising, or maybe the Toronto Defiant and maybe get more of a starting hitscan gig. While it's a bit sad to see Kilo's journey with the O2 Blast slash Shock family come to an end, I will say that this is probably not the last we've seen of him as there's a lot of untapped potential just waiting to be unleashed. Next up, we have one of the most major moves of the entire offseason coming from the NYXL who announced that they are parting ways with their entire team as well as their coaching staff. Given their performance this year, this was rather expected. They were unacceptable 
incredibly bad, and a redo was desperately needed, but it also helps that a lot of players in general are entering free agency. Rumor has it that more teams could be looking into Western talent slash local talent, I guess you could say, to avoid visa issues, and the NYXL would certainly be a prime candidate to follow that trend. Now, of course, seeing this roster disband so soon is a major shame. This team definitely did have talent, but at this point, the NYXL need fixes, and they need them now. They've been irrelevant for a couple of years now, and a bunch of fans are starting to get impatient and question if the management even knows what they're doing. It's time for a new chapter be it through Western or Korean talent, I hope that they figure it out. Because let's be honest, fans are starting to question whether or not their management even knows what they're doing. They just want to return to the good old days, and you can't really blame them. And in return, though, all of their players are now finally set free. Good for them. Plenty of these guys definitely have great talent and could make a new team. Yaki was still pretty good this year, and would make for an excellent addition on most damage lines. Put him in a better situation, and he could do some serious damage for you. And honestly, I feel the same way about Gangnam Jin. He just needs better support around him, and to be put back on that flex support role. Other guys who still have a chance but you might be less confident with are Flora and Kellen. They didn't play all that great this year, but we know they're young and full of potential, so they might be worth taking a look at. Give them both better coaching and a more organized system, and they could be capable of some great things. No matter where all of these players go from here, I wish them all the best of luck, as they deserve a lot better than what they got in 2022. Now let's move into the LA Gladiators, who announced the contract status of their entire roster. Everybody except for Kevster and Funny Astro is officially in free agency. Now, keep in mind that some of these guys could come back. The general manager has confirmed that there are no goodbyes official just yet. Regardless, a lot of big names are now on the open market technically. For GLADS fans, this is a scary time. It's good that you still have Kebster and Funny Astro as a foundation, but losing their tanks and Shu as well would be a monumental blow. Shu is literally one of the best players in the entire world, and if the GLADS don't get him back, they'll be in serious trouble. But at the end of the day, he and the others do have the freedom to go wherever they wish. They can renegotiate with the GLADS or maybe go towards a better deal. A lot of them are very good and could easily find another home if the right deal comes their way. Like, could you imagine a world where Soul Dynasty snags Shu or something? And what about Reiner? A team like Houston or Atlanta would be a great benefit for him. The Glads better be prepared, because some of these teams who are just a piece or two away could end up swooping in and ruining their title window. The London Spitfire are another team who announced the contract status of all of their players. For starters, they parted ways with Shaq's Poco and Khan, and nothing really comes as a shock here. None of them were really part of the main core that won this team a lot of games, and basically were just rotting on the bench anyway. London don't really lose anything of value since they're all bench players who didn't start, and they could probably get some better bench pieces who contribute more. For the guys that are entering free agency, all of them in theory could find new homes, right? Khan, I think he's going to be the guy to look out for here. He's a starting caliber flex support who could be of use to a handful of teams around the league. He definitely has what it takes to lead a team and be a solid playmaker, and I think we'll probably see him picked up by a new team very soon. And then there's Poco. If he doesn't retire, I think his veteran presence could benefit a lot of these lower tier rosters. Some of these guys definitely have options, and I'm not overly concerned about them. On the other hand, though, we have the fact that the Spitfire revealed Hottie, Backbone, Admiral, and Landon are under contract for 2023. With the exception of Sparker, who is still technically under negotiations, this was the core that allowed for London to be as good as they were. They're all core pieces that make London a very special team, and it's good to see all of them back for another year. It's definitely well-deserved. Now it's just a matter of building on what you have to continue improving. Let's move into the Toronto Defiant now, and sadly for Toronto fans, it looks like the consistency you are finally hoping for is not going to come true as Twilight, as well as Although and Muse are off the team. Muse and Although, while good, were kind of up and down, I'd say. They had their moments where they're important to the team, but then there are other moments where their counterparts would kind of just put them on the bench permanently. I think especially we saw it with Muse as this year went on. He just wasn't what the team was looking for leadership-wise. I mean, it even got to the point where during the playoffs, they benched him for hot butt in a Winston meta. Like, what does that tell you? And with Although, it was mostly just in like a Genji meta where he was decent, and they split time with Finale anyway, but the big news obviously here is Twilight. It really makes you wonder what exactly happened internally with him and the rest of the team. They finally had a core, and now it's been thrown away just like that. 
Twilight and Hisu were key players, and they're out of there now. Did Twilight maybe have, like, a one-year deal or something? Or was some sort of choice made here? Regardless, it's a huge blow, as they've never had a flex support of Twilight's caliber, and they may never have one like him ever again. So in other news, Twilight is an unrestricted free agent now. He proved that he can still compete with the best of the best at his position this year. Just about any team would be lucky to have him, and surely some of those borderline title contenders are going to throw offers at him. A team like Seoul, maybe even like Philly, or the Glads if they don't get Shoe back would be pretty big landing spots. Twilight is a huge name to keep an eye on this offseason, as he would drastically change the future of whoever he signs to. Moving on to the Spark, they parted ways with Architect, Teru, and Bernard, and there's nothing too crazy here. Architect wasn't really starting caliber anymore, it was only a matter of time. Bernard, he also kind of had a down year, so not the hugest loss there, especially with Gushway on the rise towards the end of the season. And then there's Teru, who's maybe more of an interesting case, since he did play somewhat well in the playoffs, some would argue pretty fantastic. But it's important to remember at the end of the day that he was just a mid-season pickup. Regardless, of the short-term success, he likely was just there to get them by. The good news for him, though, is his playoff performances on the Kirtiko might have been enough to give him a new job opportunity somewhere else, or at least get a bunch of trials. I think a team like Guangzhou Charge or Philly Fusion could have a little bit of interest at least, but we'll have to see. The good news for Spark fans, though, is they still have their main core, right? You have Shy, you have Alpha Yi, you have Gushui. That's perfectly fine. You can build a team around that, no problem. But in other Spark news, they also parted ways with their entire coaching staff after just one season. This, in my opinion, was the right decision. The Spark ended this year on a high, but there were a lot of ups and downs and questionable decisions in between. Changun's coaching style has received a lot of criticism throughout the years, and it's probably a good thing the Spark did not fall into the trap of bringing him back just because they randomly did good in the playoffs. They can definitely do a lot better. A more consistent coach could see them make the playoffs with relative ease instead of having to sweat their way through the play-ins. And rumor has it, they might be looking towards former Hunter's head coach RUI, which means Spark fans don't get overly attached to people like Irony and Alpha Yi. They could end up being gone too, because if RUI comes in, I'd say there is a solid chance they go fully Chinese where they just invest in Shy. Keep your eyes peeled. Moving into the LA Valiant, it would seem that they, in a very quiet way, have released their entire roster. Initially, like I told you in the previous video, we had people like Marvel, Easy Han, Innovation, and Becky, but now Sashin, as well as all of the other Chinese players, are entering the free agent market as well. This team is completely cleaning house, which probably doesn't come as much of a surprise. Now, it's a real shame, as I'd say most of us want to see Dia and some of those other likable faces succeed and continue to be in the Overwatch League. There there's just no real shot, right? This Valiant organization and the way they're ran currently just isn't really lined up for long-term success. Their management is always very sketchy to begin with, but they don't exactly have a lot of spending money and they're probably looking to get the most minimal contracts every single year. Until further notice, this seems like it's going to be the sad life of any Valiant fan out there. This is going to be your team, completely resetting all of the time until something changes with the money. I wouldn't be surprised if this team kind of takes on the diamond in the rough mindset again, where they just get young talent and hope for the best. Looking into all of the guys now in the open market, I'd say at least some of them have a decent shot of staying in this league. Somebody like Marvel proved that he's still a reliable tank player at this level. You have Easy Han, Innovation, and Becky, who are all very skilled DPS players. Dia, I mean, he's Dia. He's a veteran and is really solid under the right circumstances. And don't forget about Molly either. He is still a really good player who could shine on a better team. But yet again, it's going to be a new era for the LA Valiant. This is like, what, year four now, where it's just a completely different team? What a disaster. I'll spare any Valiant fans out there, though, and we'll just move on. Next, I wanted to briefly go over the San Francisco Shock, who parted ways with assistant coach Casores, and that's even more indication to me at least that they could be looking to transition to a fully Korean environment. I really like Casores as a coach though. He's a really smart guy and a great person to work with. He's got a good resume and a lot of success that has followed him throughout the years, and it would seem that his leaving does not come without some benefits as the Toronto Defiant have brought him in as their new head coach. 
In typical fashion, another former shock coach is going to join the mix of trying their luck as a first-time head coach. And in previous years, we have seen some mixed results from some other guys. Some people have done really bad after leaving the shock, and some have done really well. I, for one, think Casores could do a really good job, and I'm a big-time fan of this move by Toronto. Coaching was something they struggled with big-time last year, and Casores seems like a reliable option to get you back on the right track. What him and management intend to do with the roster from here could be up for debate, they could go mixed, maybe fully Western, but regardless, I think it's good that he's here. It helps at least soften the blow a little bit after losing some of their big-time names. It's always a gamble going for these shock assistants, as you never really know what's going to happen. The success rate is like 50-50, but for the sake of Toronto fans, let's hope that the coin toss goes your way. Oh, and while I'm on the topic of the shock still, I just wanted to make a quick correction from the previous video. I made a statement saying that the shock should go for both Max and Junbin of O2 Blast, aka their academy team, but this year Junbin is not going to be turning 18 until like the end of the season, so it's not likely he joins the shock. Apologies for misleading anybody in that regard, and promise to be more accurate with my information moving forward. Now for the final stop in this video. The Overwatch League recently announced their roster construction rules for the 2023 season, with some key dates to take away, as well as some other rule changes that I quickly wanted to highlight. To quickly glance through the timeline, on November 19th, we have the beginning of free agency, meaning that teams can officially offer contracts to players on the open market. Then, on January 16th, the deadline arrives for all teams to have a minimum of five players signed to season-long contracts. So that means none of that two-way or 30-day nonsense. It's got to be the full guaranteed deal. Then, a few months later on March 1st, we have the deadline for all teams to have a minimum of six players signed to their roster. And that six mark is very important because that's the minimum number of players you need on a team at any point in the season. Additionally, the minimum salary for the Overwatch League has increased to 54 4,249 US dollars to reflect a cost of living adjustment based on global inflation rates. I don't remember exactly what the minimum number was before, but hey, more money is more money, I guess. In terms of overall structure, it's similar to last year. You need a minimum of six players on your roster, like I said before, but can only have a maximum of 12. You can also have team options of up to three years for any given player, meaning you can choose to accept or decline every single year based on performance and other needs, and you're also allowed to sign players yet again to 30-day deals and two-way contracts. The big difference here that's different from last year, though, is that 30-day deals no longer stack. After the 30 days are up, said player becomes a free agent and you either have to negotiate a full deal with them or they can go look somewhere else. It's been a problem in the past where teams kind of just stack them over and over and over again, so this was a necessary change and I'm glad the league made it. And that's actually going to do it for episode 2 of the news recap. I know, it's not as crazy as the last one, but that's because most teams have already made all of their drops happen. But this is just the dropping slash accepting of options section of the offseason. We're basically in the calm before the storm, ladies and gentlemen. We are mere days away from the start of free agency, and I promise you the floodgates are going to go wide open again when that time comes. It seems like the status of a lot of teams and players is uncertain, so we could see a lot of different changes that really shake up the landscape of this league. There's going to be a lot to digest, and it could be overwhelming, so if you want to stay well informed on all the stuff going on within the Overwatch League offseason, be sure to subscribe to this channel and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out on any of the newest offseason recaps. And if you enjoyed this content and you want more just like it, be sure to give this video a like and let me know all of your thoughts on the news we covered down in the comments below. And as always, thank you all so much for your support. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is ATP, signing out. Peace.